Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Alwyn here. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful day as always. Today we're going to be getting into Mad Money. This is 323, which is March 23rd, which is yesterday. This is Tuesday. Uh, we're going to be reviewing or summarizing Jim Cramer's Mad Money. Uh, and like always, make sure you guys do go down below and subscribe to Jim Cramer's Action Alert Plus com. You know, there's huge value there. I definitely would recommend it. Uh, for, you know, myself, I love using it. And then also his realmoney.com. Uh, he posts every day there too. Really, really good information that I would recommend that you guys do subscribe to. Uh, in terms of the markets yesterday, the Dow was down 0.94%. S&P was down 0.76%. And the NASDAQ was down 1.12%. So a very, very red bloodbath day like yesterday, right? So let's get right into it in terms of what was Kramer saying to buy, sell, and hold yesterday. So... He's still on the same idea of cyclicals, right? He's going to push, and we'll see this throughout the show, stick with the cyclicals as we saw on Monday, right? Specifically the bank stocks, right? Industrials, we talked about a lot of names, such as Deere, Caterpillar, Cummins, uh, United Rentals yesterday, which are really good companies that are actually soaring, you know, today in, Wednesday, in Wednesday's market, especially Nucor uh, was up, I think, around 5 to 7% throughout the day. Um, he said Zoom, you know, you can go ahead and buy, you know, if you really like Zoom, go ahead and buy, you know, half your position now. And then maybe when the stock falls by halfway, you know, buy in more. Uh, and then he said five below too. Five below is one that, you know, people are kind of discounting here. Um, and it's a nationwide thing, not only statewide, right? And then in terms of a hold, he said Honeywell, uh, definitely hold on to that for a longer term play. Palantir, yeah, we don't know much about it. There's a lot of secretive stuff about it, but it's a good software company that, you know, obviously we know Kathy Woods is in. Um, then he said VF Corp is another good one to hold on to. Again, selling, you know, take some, you know, start to trim your tech, right? If you're up big, if you have a lot of profits, lock in some of those profits on tech. And he says always switch them into cyclicals, right? So that way you're well prepared because he strongly does believe he keeps on coming on air and saying that he does believe that there's still more room to run for these cyclical slash reopening stocks, right? So take some, you know, trim some of your tech and growth into profits, especially SPACs. You know, there are a few good companies, but all of them are kind of coming down because there's like SPAC, like I said, one, two, three, four, five, which, you know, he, you know, BFT is one example of that. There's just so many that, you know, he's not able to, you know, even know what's happening. So that's just too much risk, way too much speculation. Uh, and some of these are even trading now down below $10, which is just crazy. Uh, and then we have Peloton here. Uh, he said that there's a lot of better options than just Peloton alone. Um, so kind of look in those different directions. Uh, but let's get to the first part. His first part was starting off with dissecting the uh, dissecting sorry, the bottom, the 2020 bottom. Right, so the first thing that he gets into is a crescendo. What is a crescendo? You've heard him talk about this before. It's essentially when all of the selling, like all the selling pressure comes in at a head and essentially all the instruments will crash and essentially like in a conclusion, right? So the last big crescendo that we've seen was in 2020, right? 2020, March of 2020. Specifically, this was again yesterday, one year ago. So, you know, day yesterday and a year ago, exactly, which is March 23rd, 2020. This is when we saw our last big crescendo here uh, that, you know, Kramer really begins to dissect, right? So here, the main thing is that these younger investors, as we kind of talked about yesterday, how younger investors are kind of doing things for, you know, doing the right things for the wrong reasons in this market, kind of the same thing before too, is what we're seeing. The younger investors were doing the right thing. The younger investors were running in, while the big institutional guys, you know, they were kind of running right out and even some were shorting the market pretty heavily. Okay. So what Kramer says that, you know, how do we, you know, really understand, you know, the bottom is coming and it's maybe time to start buying into some, how do we, you know, identify when this crescendo is coming around, right? One thing that he talked about is one of his colleagues, you know, uses ratios. And what does he mean by that? He uses ratios in order to spot the crescendo right? Sellers were overwhelmed, you know, sellers overwhelmed buyers hear this by a ratio of nine to one, nine to one last year during this time, March 23rd. Okay. So nine sellers for every one buyer. So this, he says, is like the exact textbook definition of an actual bottom, right? It's a textbook definition of a bottom behavior, right? So this was, you know, essentially show that, uh, Hey, everybody was giving up on the market. There were nine sellers for every, you know, one buyer. So pretty much a sign that everybody was giving up on the market, right? And Kramer likes to look at something else, which is called, he says, AYHYs, which essentially stands for accidentally, accidentally high 
yielders, accidentally high yielders, okay? And what does this mean? Well, if we have a stock, think about it this way, that was trading at 60 bucks, right? And because of the pandemic, you know, a lot of these companies got crushed 50%. Right. Say, uh, you know, that, you know, they've been consistently offering a 5% dividend. Right. And then now let's say like, you know, okay, uh, you know, year later we have March 23rd, which was yesterday, 2021. Okay. Stock is back at $60. Okay. So if they maintain this 5% dividend, say you hypothetically, you bought here at $30 a share. Well, if you bought at $30 a share, not only did you get 100% appreciation here, if your actual asset underlying asset, your equity, Right, but you're also getting now double. And why why does that make sense? Double the dividend? Well, if you bought it at thirty dollars, okay, share price today is at sixty dollars sixty multiplied by five percent, you know, that's gonna be ten percent now of that value. So you're instead of getting that three dollars, you're now getting six dollars, right, per share. Uh, but what we have to realize there is it's only thirty dollars, right? So it's a lot more, it's increasing a lot more. Sorry, three dollars, right? So I said that wrong here you're getting $3 instead of 150. So you were getting 150 before, that's just 5% of 60, I was just doing some quick math. And now you're getting three, uh, you know, $3 in dividends because the stock price is $60, but you bought into it at, you know, $30, which is why you have an effective dividend yield of 10% essentially, right? So the biggest thing here is that, okay, we have, you know, a dividend yield, right? But essentially if the price cuts in half, well, that dividend yield, just think about it, is going to double essentially once the price comes back. Right, and that's what we saw. A lot of these stocks, especially higher yielders, their their price fell 50%. Right, and that's something that's really important. One thing that he pointed out is that while the average, uh, you know, what essentially happened is by you know March 23rd exactly was the bottom, but we'll talk about that in a second here. There were in total 79. Let me write this down. 79 companies. 79 companies that had declines of 50%. And what did they have? Well, they had also yields, dividend yields of 5%, 79 companies out of the 500 in the S&P 500, okay? This was that. And then so past that point, what else can we say? He also said one very important one was that 119 companies were down 40%, you know, from their highs and they had a 4% yield, okay? So these are stocks like even Apple, right? Apple usually has, you know, less than 1% dividend yield, but you know, the stock price, you know, I think its market cap went from 2 trillion to 1 trillion which means that it shares effectively half or cut in half, you know, in the bottom, you know, which was around March 19th, which we'll cover here, right? But what does that mean? Their dividend yield increases, right? And out of the S&P 500, these 500 companies, 79 dropped 50% and their dividend yield 5%, 119 dropped by 40% and their dividend yield is at least 4%. Right, so huge, huge buying opportunities are accidentally high yielders, right? So companies that wouldn't have such high yields that you were getting a really, really good hand on during this time. And that's how he says you could spot the crescendo. One, looking at the ratios or looking at accidentally high yielders. However, this was, you know, a national health pandemic. So it wasn't as easy to spot just looking at the financials, right? But one thing that he also, he also points out is that yes, right? What do we know is that the averages hit the bottom, the averages hit the bottom on March 23rd, right? But the actual tech stocks the crescendo, I should say, before getting there happened on the 19th, right? The 19th of March. So a little before, which created some confusion at the bottom, right? Because stocks, you know, started to rebound at the same time, these stocks that begin to rebound were these stay at home stocks, right? And keep in mind, another thing that we have to get to here is that S and P inclusion, Right, a lot of tech or, you know, S&P is made up of a huge part of tech, right? So what does that mean? Like if S&P, you know, if the, you know, if the actual averages, you know, tank, like, you know, hit the bottom on the 23rd, that means they were also pulling down tech, even though the crescendo happened on May, March 29, sorry, March uh, 19th, people were still very, very confused during this time because March 23rd is when the actual averages are going to bottom, right? So since the averages, you know, S&P 500 includes a lot of tech, People were confused because they were keeping getting price cuts, right? Their targets were getting cut and cut and cut. So people were very confused, but it was at this time, March 19th is when we began to see the crescendo and then it take off until like just recently a month ago or so when we saw it kind of coming to an end or at least slowing down, right? So then Jim Cramer comes into what was the problem? Was it Wall Street? No, the problem was not Wall Street here. It was Washington, okay? Washington DC and the politicians. Why? This had to do specifically with the stimulus package. Right, it had to do with the aid, had to do with the relief package, right, the first round of stimulus, 
right? Essentially, there was some political, so it was expected to go like perfectly as planned. However, on the last day, there were some procedural problems that there was a political gridlock between the Republicans, you know, Republicans and Democrats. They had some disagreements, which quickly, quickly panicked Wall Street, right? And that was the exact time it bottomed. For the people who believed that, you know, the government was going to pass a stimulus bill, then they, they, they planned correctly because they got into the and they got, you know, pretty much relatively close near the bottom. But for people who thought they would not, especially people on Wall Street who thought that the stimulus bill would not pass, they didn't catch the bottom because they think they thought at least things would get worse and worse. Right. So really, who do we blame? Jim Cramer says was Washington, D.C. The politicians didn't realize how big of a role they had on the economy there. OK, now, the next thing that I wanted to cover here is that there was no uniformity. Right? There was no uniformity to the sell off. And what I mean by that, you have to realize there's two things, right? There are the losers and there are the winners, right? Who are the winners during, you know, the 2020 crash here? The winners are you're going to be your essential guys, right? Essential retailers who are going to be your losers, non essentials, right? The people like Target, you know, Foot Locker who are closing their stores down, Macy's and things like that because of the pandemic. Right. And the final bottom line here was that, hey, you know, a year ago, there was the bottom of the coronavirus and the winners took over as the leaders, the losers fell down. Yes, the government did save a lot of these companies. Uh, so that way they didn't go under. And Carnival was a great example of that. So bottom line here is what Jim Cramer says, and I quote, now we have a similar change. It may take a while until we get to another crescendo. Keep in mind, this is talking about today's date. So he says, we're not yet there and we might see still more selling pressure. Okay. So that's the biggest thing. We still might see more selling pressure. Okay. Getting into the next part was, uh, Aqua Bounty and you know, their technology. So essentially what they have kind of what's their deal here. So, you know, relative, very, very speculative company, uh, which we'll get into here, but it you know, has to do with salmon specifically genetically enhanced Atlantic salmon. Okay. And they, you know, one big, one of the big things here is that they did get FDA approval in 2015 they got fda approval in 2015 then they went ahead and built infrastructure for these salmon farms and then last year as of last year it had a huge run up uh because they were you know preparing for their harvest and one of the big parts about this company that kramer highlighted is that it's a part of kathy wood's arc invest fund who owns believe it or not staggering 12 percent of the company okay but like i said before just a couple seconds ago it is high spec. It is very, very high spec. Why? It's early stage. So these companies have no earnings at all. They don't have any sales or revenues as of now, right? But one of the biggest things is that they do have a focus on sustainability, affordability, and accessibility. What they say, at least CEO says that affordable and accessible food is only because of GMO, genetically modified, right? Foods. Uh, so, so they say there's a lot of like negative, you know, kind of ideas surrounding genetically modified foods, but they're trying to get into the industry and clear that idea up because it's actually good protein and they're doing it in a sustainable fashion. That's better for the environment overall. Uh, but there's this, you know, kind of, you know, wrong sense around genetically modified foods, right? So those are the biggest things. Sustainability is really a key factor to today's market. Younger investors love sustainability. And then affordability and accessibility is huge for food because we know when we go to the supermarket, we always want to pick what's cheapest, uh, not necessarily always the most expensive thing. Uh, and then the last point that I really like that she pointed out was this idea of rural rejuvenation, which is essentially that, you know, what they can do is they can put essentially these farms like these salmon farms or fish farms pretty much anywhere where, you know, she said that at least they get quality and quantity of water. And then they get sources of renewable energy, preferably, right? They don't want to have to use, you know, non-renewable energy. They want to make sure, like I said, they're sustainable. Oops. They want to make sure they're sustainable there, right? So that's the biggest thing. And then, so in terms of, you know, rural rejuvenation is that since these, you know, pretty much farms can be placed anywhere with clean water, you know, and renewable energy, and even in the heartland, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, it can be anywhere inland essentially is what they're going for, right? But this idea of rural rejuvenation is important. Why? They're taking jobs essentially to underserved communities, which is really important. And they're also bringing healthy and affordable because it is GMO based, right? They're bringing healthy and affordable and accessible protein to those consumers in underserved areas. Jim Cramer does want to highlight this is very, very speculative just because it's an early stage company and they don't have sales, but they are disruptive, right? They are disruptive. And that's in part why Kathy Woods Fund owns 12% of the company. 
Okay, so that's a little touch on Aqua Bounty technology. And then another segment that I really liked, and you guys should also tune into here, was Off the Charts, where Jim Cramer talks about this thing about an Easter tide. You know, there's, you know, a chartist, famous chartist that Jim Cramer's been following by the name of Larry Williams. He's done some great work in predicting, you know, the turnaround. He said, you know, last year it would happen in mid May of 2020, which he was absolutely correct when, you know, all the smart money people were convinced that the downturn, downturn would only get worse and worse, but he was actually correct. So he's a pretty big, you know, guy looking at these charts and things like that. But he talked about this idea of an Easter tide. Essentially what that means is that around that Easter weekend, we can expect, you know, certain stocks, specifically when Jim Cramer says the essentials, such as Costco, Amazon, Walmart, and Shopify, to have a boost, you know, either, you know, if you buy it before or the following day after Easter and let it run, you know, maybe for two or three days, or even, you know, maybe two weeks to four weeks the entire month of April, there will be a run up because of this Easter trade. A lot of these things, you know, such as, you know, Costco and Amazon, 34 years, you know, 16 year Shopify is a little newer, I think four or five years this trend has worked for but it definitely has been working for a prolonged period of time. So there is some things to back it up there. Um, so it's been happening in the past where we see after Easter, there has been a run up and a spike. So if you want to trade that, you know, at least for the last, you know, 34 years, at least for Costco consecutively, they have been seeing an uptick there by at least 43 points, uh, you know, for every day, at least in the last 34 years, which is huge, huge. Um, and then, you know, moving on from that, so that was really interesting. You might want to consider trading it. He did go into Eclipse Ventures, uh, which they were, and I don't have that here, but they were doing a pretty cool deal with Outlet, which is essentially, think about it, as a connected nursing platform where they're essentially saving a lot of babies' lives. So it's a very cool thing. Definitely look into Outlet and Eclipse Ventures. I, I like the idea personally a lot too, but I do want to get into our last point for today, which was Jim Cramer's no huddle offense. What this was about, it was surrounding the pandemic, right? So what he says, he, first he touches on the rules. The rules that we have in place are, he says, nonsensical, right? He goes into specifically talking about Regeneron, which does have a drug that reduces the risk of hospital hospitalization or death by almost 70% for every, hear this, every variant, and may be able, they may be able to produce almost 1 million doses by the end of the second quarter. But we don't know if this is actually, you know, going to become widespread and very popular, though it does have, you know, 70% uh, it's able to, you know, essentially reduce death or hospitalization in all forms of variants, which is huge, huge, huge. So this is a big thing, right? But are people going to, how are people going to react to it? Is it even going to be a widespread thing, right? You can have a really good drug, but if it isn't used, then it's not effective. Right, and then he went into the next part, which are the protocols, which are this this nonsensical part of the you know market right now. Right, so he went somewhere, and a lot of places they'll take your temperature. We all know that you can be asymptomatic, and you won't see if you just take your temperature. That doesn't tell you whether you have the coronavirus or not. It's not effective means at all. Instead, they should be using you know active forms of PCR testing or whatever different types of testing that exist. Right, so Kramer showed them like he has, you know, he took the vaccine, he had, you know, the, 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 the little badge or whatever. Uh, so he showed them, they're like, no, you know, they asked him the question, have you been out of state? He's like, yeah, I've been out of state, you know, and they didn't let him in. Right, so it doesn't really make sense because like, isn't it like if you have the vaccine, shouldn't you be able to do everything, you know, like you normally can because you're immune? Uh, you know, what's kind of, you know, it's kind of like a gray area here, kind of what's going on? Why does the temperature or one question determine, you know, or override the vaccine? And then we know that social distancing for the last year has always been six feet, but CDC said for, you know, students going to school, three feet is okay. So like, you know, which one should we listen to? Is it six feet? Is it three feet? What's kind of going on here? Right. And then with cruises, cruises have agreed that old, they'll make sure that everybody on board, you know, when they do reopen, they will ensure that everyone on board is vaccinated. Right. But the CDC shot this down and they're still not on board with this idea. Right. So, but this is kind of contradictory. Why? Well, we have casinos on the other hand, where people can just walk in and they can sit next to each other in very closed areas. They can drink and they can gamble. Right. So it's kind of contradictory. Why can't he says like cruises cruise? right? If everybody has vaccines, right? And then he goes for, you know, even further saying that government can get this testing out to millions of people, you know, across the nation for just pennies. It is very cheap. And this will, you know, essentially allow us to catch the virus before we go out and spread it to other people. So Jim Cramer has been a big, big pro proponent of testing, which obviously, you know, hasn't been 
you know, on a uh, you know national nationwide scale as of now, which is huge, he says. Uh, and then, you know, why is this happening? What is, you know, all this confusion coming from? It's this idea of the federal government versus the state government, right? That's the biggest problem why they're not on the same page. So the state is deciding a lot of these rules, a lot of these mandates, and that's why overall this, you know, pandemic is kind of getting drawn out, right? So his main takeaway is that we are playing, you know, right now with pre-vaccine rules in a post-vaccine world. Right. So this thing is that if you have the vaccines, we should start beginning to open up. We need to have, you know, more at least sensical set of rules in place. So that way we're not all getting confused and we kind of have our guidelines already set. So that was kind of a recap for this was Tuesday, March 23rd, Man Money. Um, if you guys did enjoy, please do, do go down below and subscribe to my channel if you did enjoy. Make sure to destroy the like button, comment down below. Till next time. Peace.